for the moment, if Susan, you could just introduce yourself and, and, and what you're doing, really, in relation to CBDC. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you for, for organizing this. My name is Susan Friedman. I'm a senior director for global policy at Ripple, based in Washington, D.C. Um, I focus on all things policy related. And so with respect to CBDCs, we're engaged with um, governments around the world as they consider the questions surrounding the design and policy choices in, inherent to developing and potentially issuing a CBDC. Zuchin? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for organizing this, uh, Michael. My name is uh, Zuchin Mao. I'm the head of research and advisory at uh, Asia House. Um, we are a think tank and advisory service based um, here in London. So we work with um, Asia, our stakeholders, which are largely multinational corporations and as well as um, Asian governments. Um, on several topics, and one of them is really the internationalization of the RMB, um, and as well as the digitalization of the economy, which I think you know the CBDC um, topic quite uh, fit in there nicely. Um, we don't really, I guess, CBDC is not really a specific topic that we that we work on, but I think it's you know as I, as I mentioned, digitalization of the economy is is a, is a very broad framework that uh, that we work with, along with. Um, the international trade and as well as sustainability. So these are really the three main pillars of, um, of our works at, um, at Asia House. Thank you, George. Um, actually, if you can just give a brief indication uh, of, of your, <laughs> your wide experience, and uh, um, uh, Barry, and then we'll move on to the presentations. Yes, I'm a, a, a monetary historian at the University of California, Berkeley. I work on things cross-border, and that will be my focus today. Right. Good. Thank you. Susan, would you like to kick off, or would you? Yes. Sure. I'm happy to give um, a brief overview of Ripple CBDC work. So Ripple is a San Francisco-based company. We have, um, we're focused on cross-border money transmission. That system has historically been broken. And our products primarily are designed to, to ease the burden traditionally associated with cross-border money transfer. With respect to CBDCs, we utilize um, our technology. So Ripple utilizes the asset XRP in many of its product offerings. XRP is native to the XRP ledger. And our work with governments around the world focuses on providing them with a private version of the XRP ledger in which they can experiment with CBDC or stablecoin issuance to pursue their individual goals with respect to, to issuance of the same. So we currently have um, three projects that we've announced. The first is with the Royal, Monetar Royal Monetary Authority of Bhutan, and we are working with their government with respect to the issuance of a CBDC. Uh, in country. The second is with Palau, and we are exploring the issuance of a, a US dollar backed stablecoin within Palau. And recently announced was a project that we're embarking on with Montenegro, where we are exploring retail, wholesale, cross border uh, cases with respect to the possible issuance of a CBDC. And one theme that we see um, coming up, which the prior presentation touched on and which I expect will be addressed also in some of our discussion later today, is that many of these smaller countries are particularly focused on the topic of financial inclusion and how a CBDC or stablecoin can um, uh, facilitate better inclusion of their citizens into their financial uh, networks. And so. Our work continues globally. We also feed into policy discussions um, around the world. We'll be contributing to uh, the Bank of England consultation that's currently going on, uh, which will close later this, this year. But um, that, that's a brief overview of both our practical and our policy work in the CBDC space. All right. Thank, thanks very much. Um, Mucha, uh, sure. <laughs> my mind going. Zuchin. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sure. Thanks, Michael. So um, in my presentation, I'll speak a little bit about the geopolitical um, aspect of things and how that's related to China's development of CBDC by looking at the, um, really the, 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 the motivations behind both domestic and international uh, behind China's um, uh, development of the, of the digital um, yuan. So starting with the, the 
the motivation. So China's push for the digital yuan uh, can be categorized as both defensive um, and as well as expensive simultaneously. Um, given the fact that the the development has been perceived as a chance to really safeguard um, the sovereign currency within the um, global monetary system, uh, which I'll speak a little bit about a little bit um, a bit about uh, later on, um, and as well as its push for the um, um, for the digital yuan, and as well as mitigating some of the concerns that stems from you know geopolitical tensions um, and um, and the power of the U.S through the development of the digital yuan, he wants to ensure an absolute dominance of the sovereign currency. Um, it, and, and this concern over the, the, um, the monetary or the sovereign sovereignty or, or the monetary sovereignty really start, uh, stems from the aspiration to minimize some of this, um, the, the concerns um, and the impact of the potential U.S. Um, sanctions. Um, given the geopolitical competitions between U.S. and China and some of the, um, the security risks in the Asia-Pacific um, region, um, and as well as the potential blockade through its influence, the U.S.'s influence over uh, SWIFT system. Um, and, and I think additional goal um, in the development, in China's development of the digital yuan is perhaps, perhaps is also the most important one, is related to um, about creating resilience in China's payment ecosystem um, in case of disruptions to its domestic market, which are predominantly dominated by the, um, by the, the two payment system, Alipay and, and as well as WeChat Pay, which I think the, the panel uh, discussed earlier on, the dualistic nature of the, uh, of, the, um, um, of the payment system in China. Um, and, and this is, of course, because the, the central bank is really um, mindful uh, of the um, of the growing influence of the private tech of private fintech companies and its impact on uh, financial risk because then the financial stability on the Chinese economy and really sees the development of the digital yuan as a way to reinsert state dominance um, and state control um, into the domestic payment space um, especially as those two companies, Tencent and, and Financial, are, are simply too big to fail, um, given their increased role in, in commerce. So if you, and if you also look at this, this um, current situation, uh, there are questions about, you know, about how, what, what is the role of the state bank in this, right? So there's a bit of this um, disintermediation, um, concerns of the state banks from the, from the, uh, the, the Chinese banking system. Um, so through the, the development of the digital um, uh, digital yuan, the government is is a, they're part of the attempts to bring um, critical inf important financial uh, institutions and the financial infrastructures more directly under um, the central bank's control um, in order to mitigate the systemic risks in the um, in the financial systems. Um, that said, there are certain challenges, I think, with regards to China's promotion as well, uh, particularly the promotion of the usage of um, digital yuan in the, um, um, in the Chinese market. Um, and this is, again, largely because of the dualistic dominance of Alipay and WeChat Pay, um, because there's this public perception um, in the, in, in, uh, amongst Chinese that this digital yuan um, e-wallet is deemed something that's perhaps you know less inferior um, in comparison with those two uh, K, uh, two uh, companies, um, technologically inferior. So um, so the so that raises the questions about digital yuan's um, in terms of the capacity and as well as the scalability, right? Um, so here, I think the public perception really do matter. So, is there, you know, how do we how do we get uh, more people to sign up? I mean, there's of course people have downloaded the apps, and there's I think a figure around 250 million that have um, EC wide end wallets within their uh, smartphones, etc. But how do we get more people to utilize that? I think is a question. How do we get people? How do we incentivize people to use it more? Um, given that perhaps you know the Chinese public are much more, um, you know. In favor, or or, or just are, are are accustomed to the usage of Alipay and WeChat Pay. So I think the public perception is quite matters here in terms of how the digital um, RMB can break into the Chinese market. 
Um, now, with regards to the motivations at the international level, um, I think you know this is where I guess my background in international relations around geopolitics kind of kick in. Is um, is is the, um, the the one of the main purpose of I, of, of um, the development of the digital digital yen um, is to of course establish payment. Um, infrastructure and standards to promote the usage, but also, again, to mitigate some of the, um, the risks to circumvent potential U.S. sanctions um, in case of there's, um, in case of the, um, you know, a war or a conflict, um, given the geopolitical tensions between U.S. Um, US and China, um, along with, of course, promoting the RMB as an international unit of, of account. Um, so as far as the internationalization of RMB is concerned, um, it is again closely tied to the government's ease around the um, around the sanctions, given the geopolitical tensions. So although the PBOC, the central bank, has really been focused on um, you know speaking about the domestic utility of uh, of digital uh, of digital yuan, it, the project is also very much driven by the geopolitical concerns. Um, as well as attempts to, of course, internationalize RMB, given what's happening in the international context. Um, so, the um, so again, this is tied to what I mentioned before, uh, with regards to concerns that um, that in case of, of um, um, worsening geopolitical tensions or geopolitical competitions between U.S. and China, there are concerns about you know uh, that that. That the um, access to the U.S. dollar, the access to the payment infrastructure that is largely dominated by the U.S. could be challenged um, in that case, um, and I think arguably there's a strong um, element where there's where China is seeking to reform the so-called the global governance, right? Um, or in the emerging or in the um, in a shifting um, world economic order. Um, the government has not been shy to show its willingness to reform the so-called global governance. And I think Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping himself, has been clear with regards to that. So I think if we incorporate that, you know, that argument in, um, in looking at how China is, um, how, the di uh, how the development of the digital yen fits into the, um, the equation of reforming global governance, um, I think we're increasingly, we will increasingly see China act as a norm settler. So if we kind of talk about the norm takers, which are largely associated with the developing China, but increasingly China is 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 becoming norm settlers, where it's willing to kind of push forward its international, its own version or its own preferences when it comes to the rules and the norms, etc. Um, so in that case, China is seeking to carve out maybe greater greater foothold in the um, global financial system. And this includes settling the international uh, rules and norms on CBDC, for instance, in this case, given that how advanced it is in the development at the moment, um, uh, and as well as cultivating some of the Chinese um, government's leadership in international engagement on digital currency. Um, and as my final point, so just with regards to the, on the potential impact of digital yuan on the internationalization of RMB, given you know, the, how topical the issue has been in recent uh, weeks and months, um, the, the immediate impact is likely to be minimal, given that, that there's a very robust domestic um, currency control in China, which are not likely to um, loosen any time um, soon. I think that the, perhaps a potential question that, you know, um, that we could ask is, or, or, or near-term impact is, um, whether the development of digital yen could, um, or, or, should, or I should say the Chinese government will allow um, certain uh, individuals or entities or companies um, use digital, like digital yuan in um, transactions with entities subject to the U.S. sanctions. So I think there's a lot of talks about that. So I think the near-term impact is, um, is whether that, that might be the case or should the government enable this um, going forward. So I'll stop um, here. Right. Uh, thank you, Jish. Um Mary, can you say something about the, um, the sort of from, from your historical perspective, economic historical perspective, something about CBCs and how you see them given that the debate is speeding up 
and they're being beginning to be implemented in some countries, at least. I will start with cryptocurrencies more generally and then move to uh, CBDCs and, and the future of the dollar. I would start with the observation that history provides ample documentation of the fact that competing private monies are inefficient. One need only uh, think back to the history of free banking in the United States uh, in, in, in order to illustrate the point. So on the basis of that historical experience and others, I do not believe that plain vanilla cryptocurrencies or stable coins are a threat to the dollar. Plain vanilla cryptos, Bitcoin and its ilk are too volatile, too expensive to transact with. And stable coins either are not stable if they're partially collateralized or algorithmically collateralized, or they won't scale if they're over collateralized. If I have to give you more than a pound sterling to get a token worth a pound, that's a bad deal for me, unless I'm a money launderer or tax evader. So that leaves uh, CBDCs and, and the question of whether they are needed and if so, if they're a threat to the dollar. Um, my uh, argument would be they are not needed. In fact, many of the arguments for CBDCs, for example, the one on financial inclusion grounds are destroyed by other improvements in technology. Uh, India's universal payments interface, for example, does not require a CBDC. What it requires is secure messaging between banks and a mandate for banks to have an agent in every village and for people to have cell phone connectivity. Much more straightforward, lower cost, lower risk approach to financial inclusion that has worked perfectly in the Indian context. So I see only one killer app for CBDCs, and that's cross-border payments. Um, experiments, sandbox experiments have sh shown that cross-border payments can be affected uh, uh, at a fraction of the cost and a multiple of the speed of even of, of other high-tech solutions, even linking instant payments systems like as countries like Malaysia and Thailand have already done. So the question becomes who's CBDC and how will it be used for cross-border payments? We know that the Fed will not be a first mover because China has already moved. And now we have Ron DeSantis saying that a US CBDC would be a devious ploy by the Federal Reserve to infringe on the privacy of the American citizenry. So it's it, it's going to be countries like China and not countries like the United States that will, will move first. But uh, the question is whether China's CBDC will be allowed to circulate outside the country. Will China allow that? Um, uh, uh, China allowing that would destroy the effectiveness of the country's capital controls, which it values or else transactions would have to be very closely monitored and controlled, and, and, and that would create uh, problems of take-up. Uh, people would worry about uh, their anonymity, uh, and rightly so. I think even more importantly, other countries would hesitate to allow uh, China's CBDC to, to, to be used domestically for fear of currency substitution. If people move to China's ECNY for uh, transactions, they would lose control of their own monetary policy, which is something that even smaller countries value. They would lose the ability to act as lenders of last resort to their banking and financial systems. So if this is going to happen, if CBDCs are going to be used cross-border, there has to be a mechanism for different national CBDCs to be exchanged for one another. Technically, we know how to do this. Uh, the uh, Bank for International Settlements with cooperation of different central banks, including the PBOC, 
have done sandbox experiments with Enbridge's multiple CBDC bridges, dedicated uh, digital quarters with licensed dealers to uh, burn one CBDC and create another. We also know technically uh, how multiple CBDCs could run on a single blockchain. That would be a different technical solution to the problem. So we know how to do this technically. We do not, however, know how to do it politically. We do not know how to govern uh, a blockchain on which 110 CBDCs run. Uh, who sets the rules? Who designates the licensed dealers? This would be uh, an order of magnitude more intractable a problem than, for example, World, World Trade Organization governance. If we can't do this on a global scale, can we do it on a regional scale? What about uh, uh, a China-centered E-CNY block? Uh, it's conceivable that China and its close neighbors come allies could agree on a Enbridge or uh, a blockchain with multiple CBDCs, perhaps, maybe, but trade between China and, and the West will almost certainly remain extensive, uh, except in the most dire of scenarios. And if trade between China and the West remains uh, extensive, an ECNY would still be useless in that connection. So my conclusion is that uh, there may be slowly increasing use of the conventional Chinese renminbi in trade between China and other parts of the world, but not uh, Chinese CBDC. And the rise of the conventional Chinese renminbi will almost certainly remain gradual. The dollar will almost certainly remain dominant for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry, for a skeptical view. We wanted to um, engage in debate in this conference, and now um, certainly Barry, Barry has, has, has said that. In fact, your position, Barry, seems to me is very similar to the latest Federal Reserve position, which is essentially that retail CBDCs probably no, uh, cross-border CBDCs possibly yes, I think is... A fair description, which is really what you're saying. But even then, with cross-border, you would argue there are problems. We'll come back to that issue. Um, but I first want the first question I really want to ask um, in terms of the panel um, before I open. We will have a, a, a wide discussion with audience participation. But there are sort of three questions I really want to want to ask. Um, first of all, to Susan, because. We've heard, and Gary mentioned this, the two themes which run through CBDCs are regionalization on the one hand and private and public money on the other hand, and the future of money, effectively, uh, both in terms of public and private utilization. So, Susan, in terms, what, what sort of, well, there are two things. Um, one, uh, what is the level of penetration that you're expecting for both RippleNet and XRP um, using CBDCs and private company, uh, uh, stablecoins perhaps, for transfers, including use by central banks. And although financial inclusion and remittances for that matter are motivations for the smaller countries, um, that does, it seems to me, perhaps restrict some, some of the potential um, for Ripple, but you can correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. And then what are the implications, which Barry and Zucci will comment on as well, for global financial stability of actually using private money channels to a substantial degree, whether those are competitive or complementary? So, Susan, what sort of, from a Ripple point of view, how, how do you see this? Sure. Although I do want to start out um, just one point that Barry raised. I would hate for anyone to leave here thinking Ron DeSantis sets U.S. policy. He does not. Um, although I think the concerns that he raised about privacy 
are certainly valid. They're ones that are being debated globally. I think there are, we shouldn't even presume that CBDCs as they're issued would be issued on a blockchain. I think everything is up for debate as CBDCs are debated, um, whether they should come into existence, what problem people are trying to solve, what is the best way to, to formulate the tech. From a Ripple perspective and to your question, Michael, I think that um, we have always come at this from the perspective of private money can exist alongside public funds. They're not necessarily a substitute one for the other. And at the end of the day, countries should be creating the regulatory systems that allow for um, these, these different uh, entities to develop and the market can decide how exactly they will be used. Private funds, private cryptocurrencies like XRP, which we utilize to facilitate cross-border payments, are just not going to be utilized in the same way that a CBDC would, which could, for example, be used to target aid. One, one example was CBDC could allow governments to better target aid during crises like COVID to, to populations. You would not use something like Bitcoin for that purpose. You probably wouldn't use something like XRP for that purpose. But XRP was specifically designed to help facilitate money transfer. And there are applications that we think um, make XRP particularly well suited for that. So I don't, we, we don't pick winners and losers. We don't think that government should be picking winners or losers. We think government should be focused on protecting financial stability, monetary policy, and, and within those constructs, whatever survives, survives and thrives and finds, finds their footing. I think it's also notable there was a speech that former um, vice chair of the Fed, Randy Quarles, gave a few years ago where he recognized that stable coin, there is a world in which stable coins ex exist alongside CBDCs, and I don't think there's any reason uh, why that can't be the case understanding that each, each presents specific challenges and opportunities. Barry, any comment on that? Um, competition or complementarity? The survival of the fittest? How, how, how do you see this? I mean, you, you know, from your perspective. Well, I think um, it's important to be precise about what we mean by money to start. Uh, Financial, uh, multiple financial assets and instruments can coexist alongside one another, as we know. But money is a, a singular beast uh, in, in, in terms of unit of account means a payment store of value, a unit that has all of those attributes ar ar around which uh, our economies are fundamentally organized. I think the weight of history uh, is heavy, that history speaks very loudly on this issue. There have been multiple monies coexisting in the past. That kind of system has been inefficient and unstable. And over the centuries, we have, for good reason, moved to a system where government uh, provides a monopoly of what we, what economists mean by money for good reasons. When I think of stable coins existing alongside um, uh, Federal Reserve money, and I, and I should say, Michael, any, any overlap between the Fed's views and my views are, is purely coincidental. Um, I, when, I, when I think of stable coins existing alongside um, Federal Reserve money, I think of Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, those stable coins are going to be partially collateralized. They uh, are going to be trading at premium and discounts relative to uh, government-provided money. They are going to have to have a government guarantee, or they're going to be run on. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't see how uh, there's going to be an economic argument for for anything other than they it, they will be crowded out either by uh, regulation or by actual existing Federal Reserve money. I know there's a bait in the States um, about this issue of regulation and how strong the regulation should be. Uh, the, the conclusion which I think they're arriving at um, politically, uh, it seems to me, is that um, 
stablecoins will be regulated, but not in this, to the same extent as commercial banks. Now, that may well leave them in the position of being narrow banks, so with very limited credit creation based on simply on their deposit base. Um, now, I think that, 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 that is interesting. So they would operate certainly as payment transfers, um, but not really credit creation. That will still be in uh, the gift of commercial banks supported by central banks. Is that the way the debate is going in the States? I, I would just say I, that the debate is still very much open in the States, that there is there has only been a draft stablecoin bill that was just introduced by Chair McHenry that doesn't have Democratic support as of now. And I think the push is, should, should stablecoins have stricter regulation as opposed to what's what's on the table. So I, I don't think any decisions have been made. And, and I also don't want to be understood as suggesting that private cryptocurrencies or stable coins should be used as a substitute for um, central bank backed currency. I, that's, that's not our position. I think it's more that one doesn't necessarily have to crowd out the other. It may be the natural result of what happens when a CBDC gets issued, but I don't think that is the it's not a 100% guarantee or the actual end result in all cases. Yeah, the debate, the debate seems still open in the States. What, what, what I always find surprising in the States, there's a lot of talk by the Federal Reserve now about um, uh, Fed now, which still hasn't been introduced, but it's being introduced sometime this year. Um, and I find that amazing. We've had chaps for many, many years. But suddenly Fed now is this wonderful system that's going to speed up payment. Well, you're a bit behind the curve here, US. And it does seem to me there's an odd sort of thing. You tend to see the US as leading technology, or as one of the leading technology companies. But in the, in the area of payments, not so, actually. I think there's no doubt that we're behind the curve on that, which is in part the push to finally finish Fed now, which has been more like fed multiple years in the making uh, until its actual launch. Um, but I, I think that it will bring real benefits. And, you know, the debate around CBDCs and stable coins, I think, um, needs to be viewed separately from what, what the benefits of faster payment rails will mean for the United States. Zutin, any comments from uh Chinese yeah. people? Um, maybe just a few words on regulations. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, that the, the one of the develop one of the purpose um, under the in the development of, of digital art, um, digital yuan is is about uh, bring more control um, in, under the state under the party. Um, so as we have seen with regards to um, you know the, the tech crackdown that started back in October 2020, and the, now that the Alibaba as a company has been uh, integrated into six others, so there's an element of I think bring um, you know control within the um, um, sorry bring control bring government and party. Um, more control within the development of um, of the CBDC. So I think there's it's, it's a different dynamic where there's I think the state has a much more um, leverage um, in terms of the direction or the direction of the development of the um, of the digital currency in China. Okay, can can I, I continue with with you, Zuchun, but and just ask two specific or we'll make two specific points really sure. um, to what extent I mean Mary I know is somewhat skeptical <laughs> to what extent can um, we expect extended digital currency areas which I spoke about in session three um, say a digital one a digital euro or even a digital dollar um, challenge the 40 percent of trade invoicing currently done in the US dollar and, and how far do you think China has gone along that road, assuming that is an objective? Well, um, I think that's a good question. I mean, I, I think there's definitely concerns about 
the power of the U.S. dollars um, that you know the, the China is trying to shift away, um, particularly when it comes to international trade uh, with. Uh, Global South, in sp uh, specifically um, utilizing the RMB, for example. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to predict how, <laughs> uh, whether you know, the China will challenge the, uh, the, the, um, or or when China, China is, can challenge the dominance of the dollars. But I think I will revert back to what Professor Barry talked about: um, the domestic control of, of of the RMB. I think that is a that is a very big um, hindrance in terms of. Um, how far the RMB can go in terms of its process of internationalizing the, the currency. Um, and, um, um, and I think as long as there is a domestic control, there won't be. It, it, to give you an example, so if, if, if China and Saudi Arabia right, trades in RMB, let's say, um, any surpluses, that becomes a bit pragmatic because RMB is not really, um, you, you cannot convertible at the international market. So I think that becomes a, 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 an issue. Um, and this is the, an issue that stems from um, the domestic capital control within, within China. So I think uh, so long as that exists, there, there will be issues in terms of how, um, yeah, how attractive it is. Um, um, and how far the internationalization process will go. And I think there's also the trust issue with regards to the RMB. Um, is it a reliable currency in comparison to the U.S. dollars? So I think these are um, things that... Well, that well, that's better to come on to the moment. But I, I, I don't, don't think it's a question of China challenging mm. the dollar's role of reserve currency. I don't think that's going to happen any time soon as I indicated uh, this afternoon. But I think in terms of, of, of trade invoicing, mm -hmm. I can't yeah. see, that, and maybe Barry can correct me, I can't see that trade invoicing is that important in terms of um, uh, the, the US maintaining the 40% of uh, trade which is invoiced in dollars at the moment. But what, what's your view on that, Barry? Just on trade invoicing. Well, on, on on, on trade invoicing, okay, um, I you know I think the um, different functions of the dollar do complement and reinforce one another. If if trade is invoiced and more importantly settled in dollars, um, and uh, firms are therefore borrowing and and, and lend, lending in dollars because they they can hedge their trade exposure. Central banks are going to hold dollars as reserves in order to be able to lend to those banks and firms and extremists, and that that those complementarities are what um, gives dollar dominance its persistence. So I think all these things are important. On on China, um, China is trying to reduce its dependence on on the dollar, and it's doing so not by issuing a central bank digital currency. It's doing so by building its cross-border interbank payment system, a bank-based domestic and cross-border payment system, which is an entirely separate project. So SIPS is growing rapidly, but it still clears per day by value 2% the transactions that the New York Clearinghouse clears. So China has a fair ways to go. Yes, it does have a long way to go, but it's starting from a low base that could increase. But we'll anyway. I, I just wanted to just ask one final question before I hand over to the audience, um, and that is that it, it seems to me in the debate, which has to a large extent been stimulated, I think, by by fintech and by technological development, there's been an enormous amount of, of, of discussion about payments, as if payments are the only thing that the banking system does. No. The banking system within monetary jurisdictions, uh, actually the more fundamental element is credit creation and the system whereby commercial banks and the central bank operate together to ensure that you um, have a system that enables clearance and netting and final settlement at, in terms of the operation of commercial bank system altogether with the central bank. It, you know, we tend, when we're looking at payments, to look at the organizations that are actually making these payment transfers, facilitating them, whether these are uh, payment service providers or commercial banks or whomsoever. Um, uh, and, and I think that that's an important issue. Um, 
that seems to be crowded out in terms of the debate. But any, any comments from any of the panel? Harry? <laughs> right, fine, everybody agrees. Nope. That's okay. Well, <laughs> Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting, in, I guess, in the China's development is how it utilizes also, you know, tech companies to facilitate the implementation of the CBDC, uh, uh, of uh, digital yuan, is that the central bank issues <clears throat> the currency, the, the digital currency, right? But it's really up to, um, I guess, the, 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 the fintech companies to, to kind of implement it, that. So I think this is really a two, um, it utilizes so-called two-tier structure, which is quite interesting how it incorporates some of the tech firms. So in a way that, <clears throat> that there is a level of suspicions in terms of how private fintech companies can pose a, um, you know, some systemic risk in the, in the financial system. <clears throat> but it's also utilizing um, the, the the fintech companies in the implementation of the um, in the implementation of digital RMB, a digital yuan. Yeah, that was one of the internal reasons that that um, China looked at the looked at CBCs to stop the monopoly, basically, yes, exactly. and the money making, yes. uh, and the threat to financial stability within China of Alipay and WeChat Pay. Yeah. You know. Okay.